But we are actually very honored to have with us today uh, Dr. Kelsey Leonard. She's a citizen of the Shinnecock Nation. She's a legal scholar and a policy expert and a professor of environmental studies at the University of Waterloo in Canada. <clears throat> She's here to, has to speak today about water, not just as an economic resource, but from the perspective of the indigenous communities as a sacred gift of nature. It's with great pleasure that I invite Dr. Leonard to speak to you. Hello, good day, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you and see so many uh, beautiful and friendly faces. Uh, so I'm just going to get my slides loaded, and then we'll get started. It's spiraling. Did that come up over there? No, it didn't. Okay. So... We'll do this. There we go. Okay, wonderful. We've got slides. So before we get to that, uh, today's conversation is about um, Nipe, water. Uh, Nipe in our language, the Shinnecock language, uh, is our word for water. And I want to talk with you today also about this notion of earth law. I'll unpack that in a few moments as to what that actually means, but it's a part of a larger movement uh, in what we're going to talk today about rights for water and what that looks like. I also love this image. Uh, this image is actually uh, from cold water swimmers off of the southern coast of England, um, known as the Morvorans uh, swimmers, and they published a, a book about their relationship to water because I think ultimately what our conversation today is about is how do we restore our connection to the natural world, to the planet that supports us and the life and the lives that we're able to live every day. And so I, I, I take uh, much inspiration from these wonderful women off the English coast who have found ways, especially during COVID, to restore that connection. As was mentioned in my introduction, I'm a citizen of the Shinnecock Nation um, and also want to thank Hofstra University for the invitation to be with you all today. It's really wonderful when I get to come back to the island and be able to share the science and research that we're doing not only at the Shinnecock Nation, but through my lab at the University of Waterloo and with the whole wonderful uh, range of partners uh, across the state of New York and um, across the country and even internationally. So it's it's really fortunate to be able to be here to share these these thoughts and these ideas with you today because ultimately the hope is that we are able to inspire change that impacts our local communities all across Long Island. Um, so how many of you have heard of the Shinnecock Nation before? Raise your hand. Okay, good. That's, that's good. I'd love to see every hand in the room raised, but we'll get there. Um, you know, maybe if you've driven out east at all at any point in time uh, in the recent years, especially uh, after uh, the onset of COVID, you may have seen our Shinnecock monuments. Uh, that is Shinnecock land, and technically all of Suffolk County is Shinnecock land. Um, and but what we are, what we do have right now, um, is our current territory, uh, which you see here in purple. That is uh, the Shinnecock territory located. We call it the Shinnecock Neck. It abuts and is um, adjoined to Southampton and Hampton Bays. We also have territory that sits on Peconic Bay. So Peconic. Bay and Shinnecock Bay and the Atlantic Ocean, these are ancestral waters. And so when we talk about this conversation about Nepe today um, and about our relationship to water, it's really about the formative relationship that we've had with the waters that maybe all of you have become familiar with and some of you may be from this part of the world, but we've been able to steward that relationship and that connection for millennia. Um, we are a tribal nation that has never been removed from our territory. So 
these are our ancestral lands and waters, and we still exist on them today. And so that's really important to note. Um, but we're also a part of a confederacy of 13 tribes, uh, historic tribes, that nurtured and stewarded Long Island for millennia and still do today. Um, and so that's important for you to understand in the context of where you're situated, situated right now um, on Hofstra University and in thinking about the lands that Hofstra now occupies. Um, I didn't have time to load it into my slides today, but how many folks have heard of nativeland.ca? Raise a hand. Okay, well then I should have totally loaded it. Um, if you have a cell phone, we're gonna do a lot of cell phone work today because I think technology is great and it allows us to think about how we tell stories and how we engage in storytelling. So if you have a cell phone, you can go to www.native-land.ca. It's a digital mapping interface that you can plug in your zip code, your township, or your, your city town, and it will tell you the treaties, well, it, and it's constantly being updated, so it's not always, you may not have the treaties relevant for this area, but I think you'll see a few of them. Um, it has the treaties that are relevant to the town or zip code that you put in, postal code. Um, it also has the languages that are spoken in that area that you occupy and live and work in and play in. And it will also tell you uh, some of the nations, um, but it's a living map. So it's constantly being updated because as human beings, we don't always just stay in one place. There's you know, a history to these places. And so you will have um, Shinnecocks and Montauks and you will have uh, Lenapes and other nations all coming together in different places because we didn't just live in bubbles. We interacted with one another. We traded with one another. We had dynamic political systems of governance and confederacies. And so when you walk on these grounds today, you're walking on the history of thousands and thousands of years of civilizations. And so that's really important when we think about our current climate crisis. And I often like to say that we're not in a climate crisis, we're in a human crisis because the choices that we make as humans are what is driving the climate challenges and crises that we are experiencing. And oftentimes, we are only considering those crises for the impacts that they have to humans. But what I wanna challenge you today to think about and hopefully after today is how are those challenges also impacting our non-human kin? the other relations, the other li lives and beings that make this planet the beautiful blue planet that it is, that is able to support our lives. Before we go even further into that, some of you knew who we are as the Shinnecock Nation, but some of you didn't. So I wanna just provide a little bit of context. As I mentioned, um, traditional homelands, the east end of Long Island, uh, traditional waters, the bays, the Atlantic Ocean, we have and still are been fisher people. So we um, harvest shellfish, quahogs, whelks, scallops, everything. Um, we also were traditionally known for being whalers. We circumnavigated the world on some of the most renowned whale ships. And that, this was about 200 years ago. So we weren't individuals that were unworldly. We were actually some of the most worldly citizens in the United States at that time. And we also are known for carving from mollusk relatives that you see here, quahogs and whelk shells, what you may know today as wampum. Wampum are seen here as beads carved from these mollusks that were then made into the belts and strands that constituted some of the first treaty agreements throughout the United States and Canada. And more so than that, I sit on the International Joint Commission's Great Lakes Water Quality Board. We're charged with managing the boundary waters of the United States and Canada and all indigenous nations. What we note there is sometimes, and they don't say it as much anymore because I, I told them not to, but <laughs> the IJC gets its um, authority from a treaty called the International Boundary Waters Treaty signed in 1909. It's often said to be the first international transboundary water agreement in North America, but it's not. Because the first transboundary water agreements, when we think about this conversation today about the Bay, about water, were these wampum belts. 
constituted, formed by our planet in water, estuarian environments, carved, and then used to build some of the treaties and bridging relationships that understood how we relate to land around the Great Lakes, around Long Island, around the Eastern Seaboard, around the St. Lawrence River. And these belts, the, the, the material for these belts, these, these mollusk relatives, they come from Long Island. They come from along the Atlantic coast, from Cape Cod, all the way up to Maine. Now, we like to say as Shinnecocks that we have the best, but it's important for you to also know that that history is a part of your history now because you walk these lands and you care for these waters and they care for you. So this is a part of a sacred relationship that you are now in. Robin Wall Kimmimer is a Anishinaabe Kwe, indigenous scientist from the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. And she has said in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, has anyone read that book? She was recently named a MacArthur Fellow, which is a quote unquote genius grant. Some of the smartest people in the world are MacArthur Fellows. And she is one of the first indigenous women to receive that acknowledgement. So Robin Wall Kimmerer, one of the first, not the first, there are others. <laughs> um, but Robin Wall Kimmerer, Anishinaabe Kwe scientist, has said that knowing that you love the earth changes you. It activates you to defend and protect and celebrate. But when you feel that the earth loves you in return, that feeling transforms the relationship from a one-way street into a sacred bond. See, when I mentioned earlier that we're in a human crisis and not a climate crisis, it's because we've forgotten that we can't just keep taking, 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 taking without giving. See, a relationship means that you give something in return. And oftentimes when that relationship and that bond is unconditional, you do so without an expectation of return. And that's what we're missing in our world today. We had it, many people still have it. But as a global society, we have become so gluttonous, so all consuming that we have forgotten to be reciprocal to give back and to do so without an expectation of getting something in return. If you think about some of the most formative relationships in your lives, maybe that's a parent or a caregiver or a sister or a brother, a love, a partner, your chosen family, maybe not even by blood. What in those relationships made you feel safe and secure and grounded. If you think about that, you think about how you were treated, it probably was based in a feeling of unconditional love, a feeling that this person will be my ride or die no matter what happens, and they won't expect anything from me. That's what the planet needs from us. That's what the planet is asking us to stand up and do. And some are working towards that and others are just in a process of awakening. And so it begs the question, what's wrong with the status quo? Well, what's wrong with the status quo is that for the past well, hundreds of years, but definitely within the past 50 years, we have legalized the destruction of nature up to a certain point. So what does that mean? Well, we've, dis we've established laws, and when we think about our environmental law system currently, it legalizes the destruction of nature up to a certain threshold so that that natural environment or that natural resource is still of benefit and utilitarian use to humans. It doesn't often consider what is in the best interest of the natural entity or the ecosystem. It says, well, we can just take a little bit more and a little bit more, and a little bit more. And so long as it's still okay for humans to swim, drink, fish, then it's okay for the planet. But what we're finding is that, no, it's not. We've lost more than two thirds of the planet's biodiversity in the past 50 years. And the most dramatic decline of that has been in aquatic freshwater ecosystems. We've lost nearly half of coral reefs in the past 30 years with some hopeful notes that they're rebounding, but in large part because 
we are starting to recognize that our existing laws don't do enough to support planetary healing. And they don't do enough to support the rights of water. So this is why you see a global movement for change. You see Friday drills with Jane Fonda and other grandmothers and elders going out and saying, we aren't going to be the generation that passes this on. You see school strikes with Greta Thunberg and Autumn Peltier and others. Any of you were involved in any of those school strikes, climate school strikes at your school? Yeah, you're the generation that led those and will continue to lead those and often will share your stories of what that meant to you and what it means to you still, how it inspires your current achievements and pursuits and dreams. And ultimately, if you ask yourselves, well, why did I put my mind and my body on the line for these activities? And even if you didn't, ask yourselves why you didn't. It probably because there was this seesaw going on in your, in your brain or, you know, good angel, bad angel. Well, the planet can take a little more or no, the planet can't take any more. And that's why you see these conversations around there is no planet B because there isn't. I mean, we have conversations right now about the colonization of Mars and other places, but that's not happening in your lifetime. And maybe we need to ask the question, should it? And even if that happened, your life there or the lives of your future generations would look nothing like they look like on this blue planet because it's one of a kind. There's nothing else like it in the universe. So there is no planet B. There is no plan B. We have to save what we have. And in the work that I do, I often work with indigenous grandmothers and they, they've said to me, you know, it's a little arrogant of humans to think that the planet won't be okay. The planet is pretty miraculous. Earth is a very miraculous place. It likely will find ways to rebound and to secure other forms of life. The question is whether we're going to be a part of it, whether we're going to continue to maintain a sacred bond. And so as we think about climate change and pursuits of justice and reform of law, we have to keep that in mind. And there are folks who are thinking in this way. There is a new emerging area of law, an area of law that I study and um, am lucky enough to have colleagues who practice within, that is sometimes it's called ecocentric law, but this law is known as earth law. It's changing from anthropocentric laws, laws that focus on the destruction of nature to a certain threshold for human anthropocentric benefit, to more ecocentric. How can we create laws that actually position the environment as being the main beneficiary, as being the holder of the right. And you know what's really interesting? This actually, it's an emerging body of law for Western thinkers, for thinkers outside of indigenous cultures and thought. But indigenous legal systems around the world very much had this ecocentric form of law for millennia and still do. And so it's both emerging, but also revitalization and reclamation of laws in this body of earth law. It was recently put forward in a law school textbook. How many folks are in law school, thinking about law school? So you might be not the future environmental lawyers, but the future earth lawyers. Lawyers who aren't defending the environment for human benefit, but defending the planet for the planet. See, that's what we're trying to cultivate, is a new generation of Earth lawyers, lawyers advocating for all life on this planet. And this textbook was published in 2020, so there are now law schools ac across the country, um, George Washington, I believe, University of Southern California, others internationally that are working to build in these types of courses into their curricula so that we actually can create these new forms of lawyers. So this law is ultimately, this body of law is ultimately about protecting, restoring, and stabilizing the functional interdependency of Earth's life and life support systems. So what does that mean in practice? Well, we think about the origins. So Earth law is both a departure from environmental law 
and a new context for its extension. We're not saying to wholly get rid of environmental law. The Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, all of these wonderful pieces of legislation, Endangered Species Act, they were important and still are important. And it's not something, you know, who studied Congress recently um, or seen the news, it's not something that you're gonna change overnight. So you have to work within the existing mechanisms that we have of environmental law, but earth law can also be something added on top. It can be added anew. They can work in synergy and complementarity. And so this former, you know, this, this opportunity allows for our legal system to evolve from localized customary laws to modern Western legal systems and really help us to dismantle this idea of this historical shift where we have been solely focused on separating humans from the rest of nature, um, this ontology of separation, that we've seen that very much embedded within the existing environmental law. And Earth law says, well, no. Let's actually see us as part of nature. If the environment is healthy, we are healthy. If we are healthy, the environment is healthy. It's that sacred bond, it's that relationship. And so what I like to say about earth law is you can imagine it as a tree. And there are branches that are currently on the tree. There are branches that will fall off. And there are branches that will be added in future years as some of you become the new earth lawyers and you say, hey, this might be a really great way for us to protect the planet and its life support systems. So some of the existing branches of earth law are rights of nature. Who's heard of that before? Raise a hand, some head nods. Not too many though, so I'm excited to share a little bit about that today. Um, that's the sort of substream of the of earth law that we're gonna focus on in the context of rights of water. Um, but earth law also identifies the crime of ecocide. It also includes animal rights, rights of future generations. Anyone heard of the Juliana case? A little bit, a few, few head nods. Uh, rights of future generations basically are cases that have been um, you know, wielded against fossil fuel companies um, who the youth, as plaintiffs, uh, youth under the age of 18, um, raise a, a claim before the court saying that the fossil fuel companies, um, through their production and continued production of fossil fuel, are endangering their right to a future um, life on this planet. Um, and those are really interesting cases. There are um, instances where it's been um, uh, wielded in the United States, but also one of the most famous key cases comes out of the Philippines where that was successfully argued. And then also there have been cases in Europe, um, most recently in the Netherlands against Shell. Um, so really interesting things coming out around rights of future generations. We have indigenous law and legal systems, as I mentioned, uh, human environmental rights. These include uh, rights-based frameworks like the human right to water. Has anyone heard of that before? few folks. So that is a international right um, put forward by the UN General uh, Assembly. So it's a soft binding international law um, that says that every human has the right to a sufficient quantity and quality of water to meet their daily livelihood needs. Um, now that's not you taking a bubble bath every night, that's literally probably about um, maybe a 50 liter bucket for you to be able to do all of your washing livable needs in one day. We also include um, the right to the um, right to a healthy environment. Anybody vote uh, last, I guess it was not last fall, I think the fall before, to see the new am the amendment, so it was called a green amendment done to the New York State Constitution. Um, so within that, few folks nodding heads, if you didn't hear about this, the New York State Constitution was amended recently to include a right to a healthy environment, um, which basically says that every uh, New York citizen or citizen of that constitution has a right to enjoy a healthy environment. Um, now, the litigation on that will be interesting, but it's relevant as you start to see things across New York State around climate change, around climate justice, um, around environmental justice communities. Um, that is often linked to folks who are trying to uh, support that right to a healthy environment. Um, notably, Pennsylvania was one of the uh, longest states, earliest states, uh, I think in the 1970s during the uh, original environmental movement, uh, they revised their constitution to include the right to a healthy environment, so one of the longest standing uh, constitutional rights. And it was actually used in many instances to be able to promote earth law rights of nature in Pennsylvania, particularly in the context of hydraulic fracturing and natural gas. Um, other forms are atmospheric trust litigation, guardianship for nature, 
that may be a little bit too much legalese for you, so we'll continue on. <laughs> um, but what are some of the thresholds and challenges for the development of Earth law? Why haven't we heard about this before? Why hasn't it? Why isn't it taking off all around the world? Um, well, there's a few barriers that we have to overcome. The biggest one, property law. Uh, property law and most of the United States legal system is based within a fundamental rights-based framework linked to property law. You might have, you may heard it, heard, heard of it as the bundle of rights. It's all based on this notion of property. That nature belongs to the owner of, of the property that the nature occupies. So there's this idea that nature in and of itself can't have rights because it is seen as property. And so earth law is challenging that and trying to circumvent that. Uh, the other issue that um, earth lawyers have is this issue of standing, which says that the interests of nature and posterity, so future generations, are not represented in law in their own right, but only as resources or use for by legally recognized persons. So the other barrier we have to overcome is to have nature actually be recognized as a legal person. If it's not recognized as a legal person, then it can't have standing to bring a claim in court saying that it had some type of violation, harm, violence, grievance done to it. So that's the big thing that Earth Law does. So if you, well, Earth Law, particularly one of its branches, rights of nature, where you hear about folks granting or not granting, recognizing the legal personality of a natural entity, it's because they're trying to then, it's the first step, it's not the last step in earth law, it's the first step to overcoming one of the barriers so that you can then put forward a claim in a court of law that allows for the natural entity to be heard. The last, the next barrier, maybe not the last, we're still, you know, it's kind of like whack-a-mole. You're like, okay, here's one barrier, okay, there's another one. Um, but these are the big ones that come up. The next one is guardianship. So there's no established mechanism in the law currently to permit one person uh, to represent and speak for nature or for future generations to defend and protect their interests. So if that doesn't exist, you have to create it. And so that's the other aspect is, well, once you recognize that a natural entity has legal personality, who gets to speak for that entity? And so you have to create a mechanism or a forum or an institution that has the powers and the authority to be that voice. So we're going to focus in now on one branch of the tree, rights of nature, which says that nature has rights. And it's about changing our existing legal paradigms and addressing the root cause of environmental destruction. Ultimately, why are people doing this? Again, a reminder, it's time for change. They're trying to change their existing legal systems because they don't think they're doing enough to respond to our climate crisis, to respond to the environmental degradation that they're seeing and experiencing. And ultimately, it's about asking this question of who is justice for? Our existing, as I mentioned, our existing and historical environmental laws were structured around creating a system of justice that empowered humans. But what if we asked ourselves, how do we create a system of justice that empowers nature and all life on this planet? And so who is justice for? corporations alone? No, because see, that's the beautiful thing about our system is it's not too foreign to actually say that nature can have legal personality or can be recognized as a legal person because we've done it for corporations. If Nestle and Exxon and all of these other corporations can have legal personality, which they do if you didn't know, it's protected by the Supreme Court, so too then could nature. At least that's the legal thought behind it. And there are different instances where rivers around the world have been recognized or have the potential to be recognized. And so, you know, why not all of the different waterways around our planet that support life for us? You know, why not any of the rivers and bays and estuary systems throughout Long Island? Why not the Atlantic Ocean itself? And I'll get to that in a little bit. And so, in doing this work, it's not something that one individual can undertake. It's really a part of a global movement. And so this question was posed to me. You've now been given all of this information, and we'll get some more too, we're not done yet. But you've been given this information. What are you going to do? We all have a role to play. And as Robin Wall Kimmer said, if we're all supposed to be fostering a sacred connection and sacred bond to the natural world, 
we have work to do. It's not something that you can pass off to others. If we're actually going to empower planetary healing, we all have to commit to it. But I want you to know that you're not alone. You actually would be part of a global movement that's been building for decades. We've seen the recognition of rights of nature in Mexico, in the United States, in Colombia, Uganda, India, Bangladesh, Ecuador, Bolivia. One of the more famous cases is in New Zealand, where the Whanganui River was recognized as a legal person in 2007, oh, sorry, 2017. And we also see that there are institutions that have been stood up to support this work, like the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, which brings scientists and lawyers and academics and um, grassroots individuals. There's a youth component. They bring everyone together in hubs and networks to say, how can we continue to movement build and how can we be a support for the work that you're doing across the planet? And we saw in the US, that the first rights of nature law was passed in Pennsylvania in 2007, I was mentioning earlier, in response to degradation of water quality um, via hydraulic fracturing for natural gas. In 2008, Ecuador established the rights of Pachamama, or Mother Earth, embedded within their national constitution. So you can see that there are global international organizations being formed, there are local um, and, re and state level laws being passed, there are constitutional amendments being made. And we also saw activism and leadership by indigenous peoples with the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth that was signed in Bolivia by indigenous leaders in 2010. And there is the UN Harmony with Nature initiative that was formed by a UN resolution in 2009, which tracks many of the initiatives for the recognition of rights of nature around the planet. I also was really fortunate to work with a global team of legal scholars uh, to put together an inter, uh, international uh, digital data portal called the Eco Jurisprudence Monitor. So you can go to ecojurisprudence.org and you can search for any of these initiatives in recent years, uh, still being updated. Um, but there's over, uh, there's thousands of different types of initiatives from resolutions to constitutional amendments to declarations that have been made in different countries around the world that you can search for and look for. It's really interesting to because we categorize it not just by political uh, jurisdiction, so Canada, US, Mexico, England, but by ecological actors. So you can search just for those mountains that have been recognized as legal persons or for um, ocean environments like Mar Menor off the coast of Spain that was recently recognized. So we're starting to see this movement build. Um, and in Canada, for the first time, we had the recognition of the rights of a river in uh, the spring of 2021. Um, it was a joint recognition uh, by a local Quebecois municipality and the Innu First Nation. Um, and so the next few slides that I'm going to show you is actually how Earth Law is, in large part, an indigenous led movement. We're seeing the resurgence of indigenous law um, and, and this leadership come through and these sort of moments of inspiration being led by indigenous peoples that are then being taken up by other communities and cultures around the world. So this is one example. Uh, this is also another example. Uh, this is Casey Camp Hornick from the Ponca Nation, one of the instrumental leaders of the Rights of Nature movement and also on the board for the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature. Um, Casey has said that water is sacred and our survival depends on our ability to place human activities within the boundaries of the Earth's ability to absorb what we do. This is just another step in protecting the sacred waters, which are the life sources of all things on Mother Earth, not just for our tribe. We have so much to learn from our waters. Everything upstream impacts everything downstream. We are all connected. I really love that because I think when we're talking today about this notion of rights of water and the way in which we restore our sacred bond to the natural world and to water in particular, we have to recognize that water as an element on this planet can physically, literally connects us all. We are a part of the hydrologic cycle and as it as that water cycles around the planet, you sitting in this room in, in Hofstra University are connected to someone else in Egypt, in Osaka, Japan, in the Pacific Islands, because that water has made its way through different parts of the world over millennia. 
and now is situated within you as a being that is made up of 70% of water, but also as a being that interacts every day with this planet and the water that manifests in it. And so for the Ponca Nation, uh, the, they actually, most recently this past fall, they recognized two of their sacred rivers as being legal persons, uh, the, um, the Salt Fork River and then the Arkansas Rivers. Um, and you can see here that I, I love that this movement, these, these, these legal revitalizations are also being youth driven and youth led. And so you see a lot of the young people and the children who were involved in that ceremonial recognition um, that happened last fall. So what are rights of nature specifically in the context of that tree that we talked about in that branch? Well, they correct flaws within the legal system. So they understand that nature has fundamental rights to exist, thrive, and be free from pollution. The goal ultimately is to restore nature to health. And they support human rights, indigenous rights, and others. Because sometimes we get this question of, well, we can't even make sure that human rights are observed and fulfilled around our planet. How can we, how, how can we even try and think of uh, instituting rights of nature? And I don't think it has to be a one or the other. They are complementary. They are synergetic. Honestly, I don't think that you can have human rights in this world without recognizing rights of nature and rights of the environment and vice versa because they're interwoven and they're interconnected. And if you, if you particularly begin to see that when you explore questions of gender justice, when you explore questions around the types of um, epidemics around missing and murdered indigenous women around the world, when you see the way in which violence against women is often carried out in different parts of the world, it's often connected. The violence that is done to them often is connected to their defense of land and water and the way in which they have maintained a sacred connection to those lands and waters and how um, their continued Oh, system update, no thank you. How their continued presence in those spaces is a threat to the types of colonial extraction that wants to occur, whether that be fossil fuels or other types of um, industrial activity. And so ultimately what we're hoping for by implementing rights of nature is working towards giving nature a voice. Sometimes that's done through guardianship bodies. It might be by political representation. Um, but ultimately it's about how do we ensure that with every decision we make, we're asking, is this in the best interest of nature? Have we even considered what nature's interests are, how they might be impacted? And so that's what this area of law is asking from us. Um, and so another uh, wonderful example is law manifests in different ways. It can be through a judicial precedent. It can be through legislation and working to write law within a local um, lawmaking body or a state lawmaking body. Um, it, within indigenous nations, it often sometimes can be put forward as a declaration. Uh, sometimes in a township or a city, we see a city council or town council resolution. Um, but indigenous nations, we often see what's called a declaration. Um, and I think it's because it's a way to say, this is our, declar our, de um, our declaration of how we operate our values and when you come to the, the to the parts of the world that we exist in that we have stewarded that we care for we want you to also care in that manner we want you to it's almost like an instruction guide of how to nurture your bond while you're visiting places that you're not from and so in uh, Treaty 3 territory, in uh, which is kind of on the border of um, Ontario and Manitoba, um, they the Grand Council Treaty 3, which is a, co um, a council of indigenous nations in that region of the world, their grandmothers came together, so their guardians or their voices were grandmothers. You can see them uh, here pictured. Um, they came together to write this declaration, and it's called the Nebe Declaration. Uh, we have uh, similar languages, so Nebe, Nebe, uh, you can see the similarities there. And they wrote out principles, talking about life and creation and teachings of responsibility and nationhood and sacredness and Mother Earth and kinds, different kinds of water and the spirit of water and recognizing that water is alive and has spirit. 
state of New York, we also um, currently have a bill in consideration. It was put forward in 2021, not much activity on it, but if you vote, you can uh, potentially shift that and change that. But a bill was put forward by um, Representative Burke in 2021 to recognize the legal personality and the inherent rights of the Great Lakes. You can see here, um, it would be called the Great Lakes Bill of Rights. Um, and I'll just read a small portion of it to you that says, the. Um, the rights of the Great Lakes ecosystem. The Great Lakes and the watersheds that drain into the Great Lakes and their connecting channels shall possess the unalienable and fundamental rights to exist, persist, flourish, naturally evolve, regenerate, and be restored by culpable parties free from human violations of these rights and unencumbered by legal privileges vested in property, including corporate, uh, corporate uh, corporate property. <laughs> the Great Lakes ecosystem shall include all natural water features, communities of organisms, soil, as well as terrestrial and aquatic sub-ecosystems that are part of the Great Lakes and their watersheds and connecting channels. And this is really interesting as well because it's thinking about water not just as the flowing droplets or the sort of physical liquid, but about the entirety of the ecosystem that it supports. It's really having that holistic vision. Unfortunately, Representative Burke's bill has not um, moved very much, but you never know. Maybe um, in a few years' time or 10 years' time or in your lifetimes, you'll see the state of New York recognize uh, the waterways across New York as legal persons. So the other thing uh, that I think is really relevant for the context of where we are here on Long Island is thinking about ocean rights. So there, um, you know, when we think about water, it's inclusive of all the different manifestations of water, ice and rivers and lakes, but also ocean. Um, and so I and colleagues recently wrote a paper um, called um, Living in Relationship, um, Ocean-Centered Governance um, for the UN Decade on Ocean Science. So we're currently living um, in a decade named by the United Nations for the promotion of um, ocean health uh, through uh, scientific exploration. And we wanted to, the slogan for that decade is the science we need for the ocean we want. Um, and in this paper, we actually explored, well, what would it look like if we asked instead, what is the science the ocean needs for what the ocean wants? Um, and so in that, we sort of contextualize this idea of recognizing that the ocean is living, it's a living being, um, and that if we did that and we approached our scientific exploration of ocean health through lenses of ocean justice, looking at indigenous local coastal communities and their rights and the knowledge that they have for ocean protection, that that could be really pivotal to reforming and reshaping governance. Um, that we have to consider data sovereignty. So there's a whole aspect of our scientific endeavors that collect data. We collect massive amounts of data about the ocean, um, but we're not necessarily thinking about where that data goes, how it's governed and managed, and ultimately, is it data that we really need for the ocean, or is it data that human needs for human benefits only? Um, because when you collect that data, particularly in its digital footprint, it has to be stored somewhere. It's, there's a high amount of energy that's required to store that data. And that's really going to be a challenge for the future of our societies, is thinking about the type of energy footprint that is required for the digital lives that we live. And we're going to have to make conscientious questions about, well, do I need to save all of that data? Do I need to save all of those emails? Do I need to uh, save all of those photos on my cloud? And ultimately, you'll probably answer that question by asking yourself, is this in the best interest of the planet? Or at least that's my hope. It also, in this paper, we ask about ocean rights. Can, how can we extend the recognition of the legal personality of the ocean? And we're already seeing that happen around the world. I mentioned the case earlier about Mar Menor, which is an area of the sea off of Spain that was recognized by the Spanish government as having legal rights um, this past October, I believe it was. Um, we also, um, have seen as well, uh, we talk about the paper, any surfers in here? Anyone that surfs? A few folks, okay. Um, 
you're on Long Island. You probably should get out and do a surf class at some point. Even if you're not like full surfers, like take a surf class. It's fun. Uh, get out. It's another way of restoring your bond with the ocean. Um, but we talk in the paper also about the movement by surfers to protect waves around the planet. So there's the longest left breaking wave in the world is off of Chicama, Peru. And a local uh, ordinance in that part of the world has actually put in place rights, uh, zoning rights in particular. Oh, I got signed out. Um, okay, we'll bring that back up in a minute. Um, do, do, do. Okay, bring that up in a minute. Um, so this longest wave, the Chicama wave, um, they put in uh, legislation, to uh, zoning laws in particular, to protect the area from increased development. Well, we could use that on Long Island. Um, but they put that in so that these buildings and the development that would be that potentially could grow along the coast would not um, impact the potential for that wave to um, not break and have that long uh, uh, longest wave break. And so um, that was, you know, the, we're seeing these really excellent, cool innovations happening um, around the world for ocean protection. Um, so we'll give you just a minute to just like sit and think um, as I sign back in. this. There we are. Okay. Oh, we'll go back one more. Come on. There we are. Okay, so I wanted to share this with you as well, especially for uh, this generation and, and folks who are sitting in this room. Um, I find it, I, I don't know, I just find it to be one of the coolest examples of Earth Law um, that has recently happened. Um, it's the first example of Earth Law being embedded into the immigration process for a country. Um, has anyone ever heard of the country of Palau? So few, few head nods. The country of Palau is a Pacific island. Um, it has beautiful beaches. People often will visit it just for tourism. Um, but the country of Palau, they've been facing many impacts due to climate change, due to erosion, and also due to the footprint that tourism leaves um, and the tourism industry leaves on their community, particularly from cruise ships and different things that will come and visit. And so they wrote in um, what is called the Palau Pledge. Um, and it says, the children of Palau, oh, sorry, children of Palau, I take this pledge as your guest to preserve and protect your beautiful and unique island home. I vow to tread lightly, act kindly, and explore mindfully. I shall not take what is not given. I shall not harm what does not harm me. The only footprints I shall leave are those that will wash away. And so every individual that comes into the country of Palau has this stamped in their passport and they have to sign it. And it's a way in which to remind individuals that you are you are visiting a country. This is not your home. This is other people's homes. And you should treat it with care and with kindness. And particularly the, um, um, the emphasis on future generations, the children of Palau, the, the children that are going to inherit this beautiful island state. Um, and so I mentioned earlier about the case in the Netherlands um, off of the Wadden Sea um, and issues um, for the protection of the rights of future generations. So you can again sort of see this sea theme, hoping more will happen off of the Atlantic, uh, 2BD or 2B determined TBD. Um, I have a bit of an earth law activity. How are we doing on time? Would we like to transition to questions? Ask some questions. How are you feeling? Questions? Yeah. We'll do some questions. I'll share the activity with you. And then if you want to do it on your own, you can sort of see how we inspire inspiration for thinking about Earth law. Um, this image here 
was developed by the Earth Law Center. It features um, different beings around the planet who have had some type of Earth Law um, recognition of rights of personality for them. So grizzly bears, buffaloes, orcas. There's a big uh, movement off of the coast of um, Washington right now to recognize the rights of orcas. So, <coughs> excuse me. So um, what we generally will do with this activity is ask you to think about what water will you protect? What type of earth law would you write? Who would be the guardians? And then if you could think of like the name for the law or even like the preamble that you would write. So ultimately, Earth Law is about recognizing, honoring, and protecting nature's inherent rights to exist, thrive, and evolve. The hope is that we create a future in which humans and, and nature flourish together. So I think I'll pause there. We'll open for some questions. And then um, I've got a few little things to share with you after. Oh, yes. And so the idea is if you could come to the mic to ask your question. Yeah, I think they may want you to still come to the mic. <laughs> Sorry about that. Good morning, Professor Leonard. I mean, Dr. Leonard. Thank you for the presentation. Just making comments to my question. You know, because you're part of Indian Nation, when the Indian Nation went from East Coast to West Coast, they were one with nature. But because of European influence in that thing about property law, especially out in Long Island when we have an issue about one for docks and pollutants and so forth mm -hmm. with the aquifer. What do you think would be the best remedy for people in the local areas to let their congressman person know how to protect the waterways? Because unfortunately, corporation billionaires they tend to be ruling right now and what the person, average Joe or Jane, could do to fight that. Thank you. Oh, that's an excellent question. Thank you so much for, for it. Um, I think everyone heard because we were in, it was in the mic. Um, so there are... Um, indigenous nations uh, on Long Island. So you have Shinnecock Nation, you have Uncachog Nation, you have other uh, indigenous communities on Long Island. Um, so they are great allies for thinking about how to collaborate and, and build, um, build laws uh, that are applicable to the local area. Um, but there also are organizations that I'll share with you in just a moment who um, offer resources. Uh, but one is Earth Law Center. So it's earthlawcenter.org. Um, they have resources for helping local communities, everyday citizens that want to try and put forward a local law or a state law or a federal law, but um, you gotta start somewhere. Um, they have resources to help folks build that in. Um, so some of the ways that we've seen it be most successful, and I would say probably would, would be very successful on Long Island, although I haven't seen it um, implemented as of yet. There, um, to my knowledge, I think there, there are a few folks that are thinking about it, particularly those that have been working um, with the um, waste management in Brookhaven. I'm forgetting the, uh, the um, activism group that works out of there, but I think they've been thinking about some things around waste management and water protection out of Brookhaven. Um, but what I think would be really interesting would be a township resolution. So look, you know, thinking about who is your local government and how could you have the local councilors um, bring it forward. Um, if you have a like a, a very conservative local government that is not like there's no um, no one willing to listen, then I think it's also about starting with movement building, community. Um, workshops and you know, getting people to have conversations and talk about these ideas because sometimes people don't engage because they just don't understand and they're fearful or they just don't, um, they're not educated on the topic. But once they sort of can see what might be the multitude of benefits, um, really leaning into people's um, connection to future generations, they, I think there's, oh, there's ways to build, uh, to, to build opportunities for collaborations. But, um, Definitely at the local level would be where I would start. Um, it also, the other way you can do it too, if you can't get council, like a township board or council to do it, is if they have a conservation board. 
um, if they have if they have some someone some entity that's charged with the protection of parks or greenlands or waters, um, you can have them pass like a mini resolution. They usually have some type of um, they may not call it a resolution. They they might call it a a proclamation or something else, um, but start there. So it, it might take a few different levels of engagement to get to where you want it to be, but that's definitely a, a good place to start. Um, and then also earth law is not just rights of nature, it's all these other things too, right? So we now have this right to a healthy environment um, protected constitutionally within the state of New York. So it's thinking about you know what types of, of lawyers, activist groups are already out there thinking about coalition building. Um, we've seen some interesting things in, um, in Canada around class action lawsuits for violations of water quality. Um, that, that, that might be something that is on the cusp. <laughs> I hope that helped you with your question. Others? Yes, I'll wait for you to head on up. I think the other thing I'll say too on the corporation side, um, you know, it can be a little touchy, but it's really interesting the Earth Law Center is working on this, is corporations are kind of like, you know, mini countries. Some of them are big countries in terms of how much GDP and money they bring in. Um, they too can think about how to recognize rights of nature within their corporate law. Um, and so we're seeing some really interesting things. Um, Earth Law Center is actually working with a, a, biz, a corporation out of the UK called Faith in Nature. They're a shampoo and makeup company that actually has put nature on their board. So looking at what does it look like for um, nature to have a seat on the board. Um, so. I don't think Exxon or Shell is going to do that, um, you know, so that's absolutely, but I think there's going to be, earth law is not, you know, um, one size fits all cookie cutter. There's not one way to do this. I think it's really on, honestly thinking about two questions. What what are you going to do? And are in those decisions that we make, are we considering nature's interests? Thank you. Yes. Thank you for a really uh, interesting talk, very thought provoking. Um, I'm a paleontologist, so I think about things over very long time scales. Mm -hmm. And the Earth has been through some trying times in the past, and uh, species have been wiped out, and, and evolution makes more species. The Earth rebounds. So I, I, I don't really worry about the Earth, mm -hmm. at least in the, in the long run. I worry about humans. Um, arguably, the best thing we could do for nature would be to get rid of humans. <laughs> We're kind of a virus. Um, so, so my question is, how do you, how do we reconcile um, what the needs of the natural world are, and whatever rights it may or may not have, and and the needs of the human species to to continue, and I, I think the answer to that question is to recognize that that when nature flourishes, humans flourish. Um, but I mean, what are your thoughts on that? So I, I would. I would agree with you. I mean, I think that's the that's the impetus behind Earth Law is, is trying to create balance and harmony and, and, and create a path in which we flourish together because that's what we don't currently have. Um, the practicality of that, you know, the, the, the pragmatic steps towards that really need to be localized and context specific because what's going to work on Long Island isn't going to work in the middle of Utah. So it really, you know, for me, it's that okay yes humans may be a may be a virus you know may may have this you know this 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 horrible impact on the planet but it's by choice um you know i think we'll, we'll i'll show you towards the end here but there is you know within indigenous epistemologies and law you know of what kimmer was saying is that you can exercise an en environmental conservation that is through love rather than extraction and that's really, I think, what we're missing is we are on this path of just taking, taking, taking as much as we can take rather than thinking about, well, is this a loving exchange? Is this something that I'm doing to care 
for the planet. Um, I and I think there are many pockets of the world that have had that thought. You know, um, you know, portion of of my work has also looked at uh, you know religious foundations of connections to environmental protection. You know, there are, there is water law embedded within Sharia law. There is water embedded within is um, Islamic law, within Judaism, within Christianity. There we for very for thousands of years there were rules because that's what law is there it's 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 your moral compass it's your rules that society agrees on norms and standards that we say this is what we value and we need to act in this way to ensure that those values are upheld and that's where i think we've we've gone off course um and so there are still many cultures around the world that practice that loving relationship but um the majority and because we've sort of been consumed or subsumed by by sort of corporate thinking um we've we've lost we've sort of gone off kilter so i think humans just have to also not bury our heads in the sand i think to, you know the, the the direct answer to your question is we just kind of there's an adage and i can't think of the exact words of it but we've sort of we're just sheep a lot of us are just sheep we just kind of follow and we you know we just sort of look around you know how many of you have apple music on your phone you or any app on your phone and just like oh app store click okay download okay yeah i accept all your terms if you actually like print it out um i think it's still true for apple music it was when it was itunes the terms of itunes were 300 printed pages long nobody read that nobody reads that now like oftentimes we are embedded within cultures and systems where we don't ask enough questions we are no longer inquisitive we just sort of follow trends and that practice that practice of not being inquisitive not being analytical not being critical thinkers not wanting to know and ask what are what will this do to the planet what will this do to future generations that is what's contributing to the degradation we're seeing. It's not solely that being a human being is you being a virus. It's the choices that you make that create the virus. Thank you for the question. Any others? Okay, scoot on over. I feel like it's the price is right. <laughs> If somebody wanted to be a lawyer and they're wondering how they're going to pay the loans off, who pays the the law or the the, the legal bills for the planet? Mm. Great, great question. Um, well, if you're a really savvy lawyer, uh, the corporation would. Whoever did the harm um, would pay if you win. Uh, that's the you know that's the idea behind it. But um, I think there are some you know, and the question is often asked. We have to ask ourselves in which jurisdiction, because the United States in large part is like one jurisdiction that has really monetized the legal profession to like such a gluttonous form that you don't also you don't always see that in other parts of the world. So you see a lot of initiatives in Latin America for rights of nature, for earth law, um, because it is um, maybe uh, you don't have this form of monetization, this form of like excessive cost to um, to legal action. Um, but it is a question in other parts of the world where um, litigation, th that type of legal action can be very costly, both for the lawyers that you hire and for others. Um, I can just give some examples of how I see people doing it now. I don't think it's perfect. I think that's, you know, the monetization of the legal profession in the United States is definitely something that we have to um, recon, you know, reconsider and reevaluate moving forward. Um, but there are, what's really interesting in, in New York in particular, if you go to law school or you go to then be licensed, you have to meet so many pro bono hours in a year in New York State. Um, so Earth Law Center and other organizations that work to promote rights of nature and earth law around the world, um, they actually get a lot of New York lawyers who are trying to fulfill their pro bono hours. Um, so you might find that, yeah, maybe some of your practice, because you have to pay bills, is made up of corporate law, but maybe your 50 hours a year of your pro bono, you decide where that goes. You know, maybe it's very much well, well, well deserved to put that towards domestic violence victims, but you might also put it towards earth law advocacy. And so that's one example where I see um, some very uh, high billable hour lawyers working on earth law because they have to meet their pro bono requirements. Um, 
In other instances, there are some foundations that um, help to support that work um, within the legal parameters of that, because there are some rules about what foundations can, can do and can't do. Um, I think there are probably some you know benefactors that like this type of work and want to protect the planet, and so they're fighting in that space. Um, Lots of GoFundMes, I think. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a lot of crowdsourcing for, for this work. Um, but then I also think that we're going to see, um, what we're seeing now, too, is a lot of pickup from um, uh, state institutions, so like, um, you know, uh, general counsel offices for the state. Probably we'll see a lot of instances of there being um, counselors needed in federal governments. We see that in um, in Canada. We see it in Latin America and other parts of the world, where the governments who often are on the hook for the fiduciary responsibility of ensuring environmental protection are going to need to have these lawyers. And so um, they will like if you're looking to say, oh, is this like, can I make a living doing this? Um, yeah, you definitely can in that space um, for working for for government um and who pays you well tax dollars do so maybe that's nice you can think oh your my taxes are going to protect the environment so that's that's probably a good thing um i don't know if that fully answered your question but it was good okay um yeah if you're asking about oh okay we didn't lose it <laughs> if you're asking about law school bills um yeah don't don't ask me about that one <laughs> look for great scholarships <laughs> any other questions we can come back to a few probably if there are any. I'll just close out with what I usually close out with, which is um, much of the information I presented to you today is information of folks who work in the grassroots movement building in these spaces. Um, not my my own information. This is not, you know, Dr. Leonard invented earth law. Um, I'm just a, a voice for those who are on the ground doing this wonderful work like Bioneers, Indigenous Environmental Network, GARN, Global Alliance for Rights of Nature, who I mentioned earlier. Movement Rights is another wonderful organization that works in this space. They help with the Ponca Nation. And then the Harmony with Nature program through the UN is another a great resource. Um, Earth Law Center, this is their um, their website, earthlawcenter.org. You can scan the QR code to be able to just link right to their website if you want. Um, but they are probably one of the preeminent organizations working in this space. Folks, a moment. There we go. So just as that reminder of what Dr. Kimmer said, it's really important for you to think about, you know, are you just existing within a transactional relationship with the environment or can you build a sacred bond? Can you restore your connection? So Tabutni, thank you. That's my email. You can continue the conversation on social media at that handle, at any of your preferred social media links. And it's been a pleasure being in conversation with you. Thank you.